All right. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to the webinar, The Truth About Digital Revenue Streams. Can you click the next slide, please? My name is Marianne Kalahana. I'm the Director of Marketing at RSI Content Solutions, and I will be moderating today's program. Also with me are Linda Marone and Vincent Donadio from Data Conversion Laboratory, and Darrell Gunther from Gunther Media Group. Today's agenda includes an introduction to our speaker, background information on our webinar sponsors, a brief online poll, and Darrell's view of how publishers are generating more revenue from digital products. I'll save time at the end to answer any questions you have. Please note that you may submit questions at any time during the webinar by typing in the questions box in the GoToWebinar dialog box. And finally, this webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to that recording in a separate email after today's show. And you can share that with your colleagues. We are thrilled to have Darrell Gunter with us today from Gunter Media Group. Um, Gunter Media Group provides turnkey services to businesses seeking strategic insights into their operations. Darrell has 30 years of experience in print and digital media and has worked with the world's leading and cutting edge publishers on their industry breaking projects. Projects like Dow Jones News Retrieval, Elsevier's Science Direct and Scopus the Colexus Expert Profiles, and BiomedExperts.com. Um, a little bit about our sponsors. I am from RSI Content Solutions, and we, were, we started in 2000 as a consulting company, helping publishers with XML and content management related technologies. Today, we are a software company that serves more than 150 customers, and we're proud of our customer successes and are thrilled to receive some of the industry recognition noted here for the work we've done over the years. Our core product is our Suite CMS, and it is an enterprise content management system designed specifically for publishers. Our suite CMS is used to store, manage, edit, and deliver content. And in 2006, the first version of our suite was released. Today, our suite serves a number of publishing verticals, including scientific, technical, and medical publishers, educational publishers, scholarly publishers, and many more. Some of the world's leading publishers use our suite CMS and some publishers you may not be so familiar with, they also use the system as well. And now I'd like to invite Linda to share a little bit about Data Conversion Laboratory. Thank you, Marianne. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Linda Malone. I'm Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Data Conversion Laboratory. We welcome you to our series. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with DCL, we are in our 31st year of transforming documents from any type into any format. And uh, in today's day and age, where every company has basically become a publisher, uh, we find that uh, the requirements across the board are quite similar. But we do service all industries, from government to manufacturing to pharmaceuticals, life sciences, financial, and so on, as well as publishing. Uh, we have become uh, quite advanced in the world of ebook production and also provide services such as consulting, um, content reuse analysis and identification, composition, transcription services, both audio and video, translation, and basically helping our clients uh, reach any and all prospects and customers on any and all devices. Um, we, again, are, are very proud to be a part of this series and work with our partner, RSI. Thank you, Mary Ann. Thanks, Linda. So we're going to launch an online poll to understand where your organization sits with this topic of digital revenue. Um, Vincent, if you could launch that poll. 
we invite you to please submit the answer that um, that best that, that best answers answers this question. When does your organization project digital revenue exceeding print revenue? Number one, we are already there in 2012. Within the next three years, more than three years, or we don't anticipate digital exceeding print. So if you can just go ahead and click on one of those options. And I see people are still voting, so we're going to leave just a couple more seconds for everyone to kind of assess where they are. Okay, um, it looks like most everyone has voted, so we'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results with everyone. And now I'd like to introduce Darrell to read through the results. Darrell? Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Well, let's see where we are. When we ask the question, when does your organization project digital revenue to exceed the print revenue? Well, 24% of you said you're already there. 3% said, well, in 2012. Well, another whopping 24% said within the next three years. And a huge percent said more than three years. That was at 31%. And then 17% uh, said we don't anticipate digital exceeding print. That is very interesting. I would suggest that print versus digital, it's really a question of a business model. Um, I think after our presentation today, you'll see that to be digital is going to be vital uh, to, to your organization. Uh, slide, please. You know, sometimes change can be a beautiful thing. It, it makes me think of uh, when you change a baby's diaper, uh, they're crying at first, but after you change the diaper, um, they're feeling so much better. And change, no doubt, sometimes is tough going through. But once you go through the change and you go through that path, you recognize that it was a good path to take. So change is difficult for human beings to accept, especially when change is brought, us, brought upon us by external parties or forces. We have all benefited from change based on history, no doubt we will benefit from this change in the future. And that change is the print to digital. Good afternoon. I'm Darrell Gunter, your host today. I'm president and CEO of Gunter Media Group. And I am here to talk about the truth about digital revenue streams. Well, let's talk about our agenda uh, today. Slide, please. Our agenda will cover an introduction of today's topic. I like to talk about facts versus fiction a little bit of history of the digital movement, uh, share with you some, some key stories, some true stories. Uh, let's look at some advertising trends and the growth of digital devices. And then the future, who new customer? And then we'll have a summation at the end. Slide, please. Now, let's get back to change. Uh, as we have known that over the course of our world's history, we've had a number of changes that have really helped us to progress as a society. Change is inevitable. No matter how hard we try to fight it, change will find its path. Over the course of the development of the United States, we have experienced a creation of the will and its in mankind. It is said that the will was developed during the Neolithic period, beginning about 1020 BC. Since that time, the use of the will has been expanded from carts, wagons, carriages, etc. Animals pulling carts to be placed on motorized vehicles. The development of the, of the vessel that sits on top of the wheel has allowed man to transport not only her fellow citizens across the vast land at incredible speeds, but also goods and materials that allow distant populations to be able to take advantage of the last goods and technologies and materials that have been developed. 
And when you think about it, isn't the internet the same? This ability to share the latest technology and developments provided man the ability to build on other material developments and share them back with the rest of the world. Think about it. Where would the United States be if they did not have a railroad? Consider where would the United States would be if they had instituted the high-speed rail line that Japan has been utilizing since the 1960s. This delay in adopting the electrified high-speed railway system has held the United States back on a number of fronts. This story reminds me of one from the SCM industry that still plagues us today. At the 2001 PSB Symposium for their annual meeting, this Professional Scholarly Publishers Division of AAP, they had a session called the e-book, Crouching Dragon or Hidden Tiger. Publishers and librarians actually debated the pros and cons of the e-book. Just think about it. What if the industry had moved forward to digitize their books back in 2001 instead of carrying on a debate on whether books would be online or not? The community is now moving aggressively to move, digitize their books and provide the research community a better, richer research experience. What other research material exists today that needs to be converted? What will it take for the industry to realize that the digital revolution is upon us? And print will still be with us, but in a way that we are not used to in the past. John Blossom, the author of Content Nation, states that every publisher, everyone is a publisher as a worldwide publishing community. Now, the worldwide publishing community, once the pursuit of a handful of wealthy and powerful people, is now a tool in the hands of the world. The world community experienced this phenomenon during the Arab Spring last year. They're sort of citizens of many countries in the Middle East utilize social media to topple countries. The fact that everyday citizens were able to express their concerns and views and inform the world community of a very challenging environment that they experience every day and to help them to achieve a new success to have a, a new country. Slide, please. Still, think that having a mobile app requires you to have a business model? What about moving all of your content from print to digital and creating a true semantic search experience for your community? Let's discuss some key stats that are exploding before our eyes. Well, first of all, there are 2.1 billion worldwide Internet users in 2012. In the United States alone, 77.3%, which is 239 million people of the population, uses the Internet. There are over 85 million U.S. broadband Internet subscribers in the U.S., and that's 27% of the U.S. population. The growth of Internet de devices has skyrocketed since 1984. Where the number of devices were at just 1,000, it has now grew to 1 billion in 2008 and is expected to be 15 billion by 2015. Still think moving to digital is a risky proposition? I don't think so. It is expected that mobile Internet users will surpass desktop Internet users by 2014. Now, let's consider some social media facts. Well, Facebook will reach 143 million U.S. users in 2012. That's up 8.2% from 132 million in 2011. About two-thirds of web users will use social networks in 2012. More than 90% of social, net, social network users will be on Facebook in 2012. Wow, now you can see why Facebook uh, is going to have a big IPL. Let's talk about online video in 2012. Online video viewers will reach 170 million in 2012. 53% of our population and 71% of our internet users will watch an online video in 2012. 
mobile video viewers will reach 54.6 million in 2012. Smartphone video viewers will reach 51 million in 2012. That's not all. Let's talk about e-commerce. 88% of the U.S. Internet users age 14 plus, your new, your, your new customer, will browse or research products online in 2012. 84% of the Internet users will make at least one purchase via the web during 2012. Online shoppers will reach 185 million in 2012, and that's up 3% from 2011. The online buying community will reach, these online buyers will be able to reach 154 million folks in 2012. That is tremendous. This is just explosive. Let's talk about some real story, some history. Slide, please. Let's consider some recent real case studies to better frame our discussion about the digital transition from print to electronic and how this transition is affecting several industries. You got to think about why did the SDM industry take so long to migrate from print to digital? Considering that the stock market was delivering quotes in news electronically since 1972. For those of you who, who may have dabbled in the financial markets, you may recall the Quotron terminal that delivered stock quotes in news electronically to brokers via a dedicated green screen. Okay, so you might say that Wall Street needed to have a real-time delivery of financial news and information considering that all of the pension funds and investment houses needed this information. But in 1981, Dow Jones launched Dow Jones News Retrieval. And anyone who had a telephone could connect their headset to a Texas instrument decoupler or some other device to connect to the Dow Jones via mainframes back in South Brunswick, New Jersey. And you would do this via a service called TyNet or Telenet. And you might have recalled when you did the telephone number, you got that strange noise, and then you got the, the sound connection. Well, the data that was delivered was moving at a blistering rate at 150 baud per minute which is very slow in compared to today's times. I can remember demonstrating the Dow Jones News Retrieval to Baron Hilton in his Beverly Hills Hall office back in 1984. Okay, so you wouldn't think that scientists and researchers would have a greater need for information as they're working in their area specialty. Well, why did it take major publishers so many years to adopt the idea of creating a digital environment? Not moving faster has no doubt slowed up the progress of scientific research as we have witnessed the slow migration of books, the development of mobile apps, the inclusion of semantic technology, and last but not least, the incorporation of video and other types of media. media. What are we waiting for? The more tools, information, analytics, analytics that we provide the world research community, the sooner they will be able to complete their research that will lead to very key medical and scientific breakthroughs. Let's take a look at the retail industry. Well, Blockbuster was once an industry darling as it allowed its customers to rent videos from any store nationwide. Well, here come Flixsters in 2007, and five years later, Blockbuster is history. It was sold to the Dish Network in April 2011, and they are now trying to circle their wagons to get back on track. Flixsters boasts that they are the leading online destination for movie enthusiasts with over 30 million unique visitors per month and 2 billion movie ratings. Time will tell if Blockbuster, under their new ownership, can reclaim the number one position of movie rentals. The second case study is a very recent case study. You've been to a Best Buy lately? I would like to ask you, well, how has your customer service experience been? Probably not too good. Well, Best Buy has over 1,150 stores worldwide, 
and recently they announced some significant, several significant changes. The first announcement was the hiring of a digital expert from Starbucks. Stephen Gillet, who is named Executive Vice President and, and President of Best Buy Digital and Global Business Services. The second announcement, not too many days after that, they announced a gap loss, a net loss of $1.7 billion or $4.89 share for the Third, 2012. Then on April 10, 2012, the Board of Directors announced that Brian Dunn had resigned as their Chief Executive Officer and Director. What happened? Why did this happen? How did the CEO put himself in a position to lose his coveted CEO role? The industry analysts have speculated that he lost his position due to the Best Buy patrons that would come to the Best Buy store, take a look at a TV, PC, etc., but would leave the store and order the product via Amazon.com. One could suggest that the hiring of Stephen Gillet was a bit too late for Mr. Dunn. Marrying the brick and mortar to your digital strategy is very important. As I say to my fellow publishers, if you haven't gone to print from digital, I mean to, to digital from print, I would suggest that you begin to run, not walk. The last case study will focus on a success story. Back in 1996, uh, Dow Jones and company announced the launch of the Wall Street Journal online. The Wall Street Journal uh, print business had about an ABC circulation of two million people. This was unprecedented as the internet was just developing and no other newspaper had begun to tackle this new internet opportunity and challenge. Just recently, the New York Times announced their digital strategy that allows their subscribers to have a subscription to both the print and digital devices. One price, you get access to it anywhere, anyhow. The newspaper industry would have had a better transition if they had not heard the internet and their strategy. Slide, please. So what has happened in SDM Publishing? Well, SDM Publishing, of course, journals are online, the books are coming online, but let's look at some data. The university faculty, how do they find articles? Well, they find their articles using digital resources. Next slide, please. The migration chronic. We hear that the migration is away to some from the UK, and I would suggest those statistics are probably consistent worldwide. Um, yes, there is a need for print, but electronic digital is what's happening. That is that's that's the way to go. Let's talk about advertising. Everyone is wondering, where does advertising play a role uh, in, in the future of what we're doing? I like to uh, say that if you were to speak with most folks from the SIIA, the Software Information Industry Group, and AAP, Association of American Publishers, Professional Scholarly Publishers Division, they would tell you that advertising in their respective industries simply does not work. Slide, please. They tout that their subscription model is king. Quite frankly, considering that the SCM generates $27 a year and mostly subscription revenue, one cannot argue with them. Secondly, consider that Britannica Publishing put themselves in harm's way some years ago when they declared that they will give their content away as advertising will support the company's revenue stream, and that did not happen. People have a reason to be skeptical about advertising being a major revenue driver for their business. But let's consider some real facts about advertising. Well, first of all, Google generated $37.9 billion in revenue in 2011. 96% of it was advertising. So if you want to say, well, who's advertising on Google? Where is this money coming from? Well, let's look at the top 10 industries that advertise on Google. Finances insurance is number one at $4 billion. 
retailers and general merchandise at 2.8 billion travel and tourism for three at 2.4 billion jobs and education at two billion. and the number five spot is home and garden at 2.1 billion Cons computers and consumer electronics at 2.0 as 2.0 billion vehicles automobiles 2 billion Internet and telecom, 1.7 billion. Business and industrial, 1.6 billion. Occasion and gifts is number 10 at 1.2 billion. Now, I think that our respective audiences have a need for all of those goods and services. So the question is, why aren't we developing our advertising business model or, or experimenting? The, instant, the IAB, which is the Interactive Advertising Bureau, notes that Internet advertising has grown significantly over the last 10 years. In 2001, the total advertising was at $7.2 billion. The revenue had hit a landmark high of $31 billion. That's a significant increase. This milestone represents a 22% increase over 2010. Now, 2010 had been a record breaker at 26 billion. So if you think about it, this is a 430% increase over 2001, quite significant. Let's look at mobile users. Uh, mobile experienced the fastest growth of all categories. Triple digit growth year over year up 149% to 1.6. Six billion in a full year 2011. Digital video, a component of display related advertising, saw a significant uptick as well at 29%, bringing in 1.8 billion revenue in 2001 compared to 1.4 in 2010. Search revenues in 2011 totaled 14.8 billion, up almost 27% from 11.7 .7 billion in 2010. Display-related advertising in 2011, those revenues totaled $11.1 billion, which is 35% of the 2011-1 revenues, and is up 15% from $9.6 billion in 2010. Retail advertisers continue to represent the largest category of Internet ad spending, accounting for 22% in 2011 which is $7 billion, and they're up 21%, $5.5 billion that was reported in 2010. Currently, I do not have uh, any numbers for advertising in the SDM market, but we do know that several publishers have been very busy growing their advertising business. Publishers like Nature, Elsevier, and the medical, American Medical Association are growing their revenue base with advertising. The question is, if your firm does not have an advertising revenue strategy for your online product, why not? Some might say that it will never pan out or amount to much. I say that if you do not begin to experiment or better yet, develop a strategy for growing your internet advertising revenue base, you will miss out on a new business opportunity. Let's talk about uh, mobile devices. As, as we see here, um, people want to know what are the number, the top 10 apps that we have here for mobile devices. Well, the exchange of money is number one. And you look at geographic services using maps. Search is number three. Information is number four. Medical information, finding information, and then, of course, advertising. And so you might wonder, if you do not have a current mobile strategy, are you lost in the game? And the answer is no, you're not. Because let me share with you some, some, some global mobile stats. Well, first of all, we know the population is somewhere around 6.9 billion. Well, right now, <laughs> there's 5.3 billion mobile subscriptions worldwide. And if you look at China, China's leading the way with 740 
seven uh, million cell phones. India, 525 million, and the U.S. is third at uh, 284 million. So if you think about it, there's 1.3 billion phones that were shipped last year, and that's up 18.5%. 74% of them are smartphones. Nielsen tells us that 31% of U.S. mobile phones, U.S. Uh, folks in the U.S., have a smartphone, which is quite significant. eMarketer, which is, which is an industry, tr industry trade publication, they predict that smartphone ownership will be 43% of the U.S. population by 2015. Gartner, a, a trusted source in the marketplace, uh, states that um, of the 1.6 billion phones that are sold, 19% of last year were smartphones. And they expect, they expect this to grow from 67 to 97 million by in, in 2011. Dakota Research Consultancy predicts global smartphone sales of some 2.5 billion phones during the year of 2010 and 2015. Mobile internet via the smartphones will increase 50-fold. So what are the top four apps in the U.S.? Europe and Japan. Social media is number one. Not surprising considering Facebook statistics. Texting is number two. Photos is number three. Now, if you, if you look at the recent purchase of Instagram by um, Facebook for a billion dollars, you can see why, because that is, a, that is a way that we communicate with each other. We're a very visual society. The, the fourth largest use of an uh, app is news information and weather. As I said, the top 10 apps are money transfer, location-based services, mobile search, mobile browsing, mobile health monitoring, mobile payment, near-field communication services such as I want to go to a, a, a restaurant that serves Thai food. Am I near one? I'll tell you that. Mobile advertising is number eight, instant messaging is number nine, and mobile music is number ten. So, slide please. Let's talk about your new customer. Oh, this is a slide on uh, why it's important to be in digital. This is from Gartner. You will see here that uh, being mobile is being digital, which means that if your content isn't digital, you can't be mobile. And they expect for this to have 40 to 60 percent growth. Slide, please. I've already talked about uh, these top four uses, which is social media, texting, and weather. Slide, please. Now, your customer. If we look at the STM products and processes, as you can see here, as a publisher, you involve journals, books, conferences. Uh, in order to do this, you have to conduct in peer review, continuing education, membership services, and archives. As a publisher, there's a lot of ways that you're involved with your author. But let's talk about in our slides. Your customer, the author, he is a consumer, she is a producer, and they have particular processes that they participate in. First, they are a researcher. They get funding through a society or a grant, a grant organization. They consume the literature and all the products that you create, journals, books, gray literature. They participate in the publishing process as an editor or someone who is a peer reviewer. They participate in conferences. They deliver conference proceedings. And they publish their scientific results. Slide, please. As you can see here, the SEM consumer is a consumer and reader. 
a peer reviewer, they participate and speak at conferences, they take advantage of continuous education, they're the member of the editorial board, they receive funding organizations, they're a member of a society, they're the author of journal articles, and they're also author of books. As you can see, this STM consumer plays many roles, and they're using many different devices to get access to the content that they need. Slide, please. The Holy Grail, you know, it's interesting with all these digital devices that we have, one statistic that, is, that prevails is that folks like to download PDFs. So what's most important is to provide the author with the search tools and capability that's going to allow them to get to that PDF by all means necessary via any type of device. And you can't do that if you're not digital. Slide, please. So the question I have for, for our audience today is what highways are you building to your PDFs via the smartphone, via the tablet, um, via the, the laptop, the desktop? Slide, please. So you think about it, you think about the cloud environment where an author sees an abstract or an article, and they, they download it from the cloud, and then they upload it so that when they get back to their device of choice, whether it's a laptop PC or smart TV, which we'll talk about in a second, they'll be able to, to access it and enjoy it in its full vision. So when you think about being digital, being digital is about being able to transmit key information to the person just in time when they need it. But if your information has not been converted, you won't be able to do that. Slide, please. And what about smart TV? We're going to see that by the end of this year, you will not be able to buy a TV that does not have internet capabilities. We're going to see that the classrooms and the research institutions, these monitors are now going to be connected TVs. They're going to be smart TV that's going to allow the professor to bring up all different types of information pertaining to their class, whether it's text, whether it's video, whether it's audio, whether it's the ability um, to Skype people in to have a conversation. So being digital is just so, so important. It's like waking up in the morning. You know, you, you open your eyes, you're awake. If you're going to be a publisher, you have to be digital. Slide, please. So when you think about the challenges that you have before yourself, you have to look at what are some of the key steps. If I'm not digital, what are some of the key steps that I need to immediately take to set a course that by 2013 we're going to be digital? Because if you're not digital, your users have access to the see valuable information that you create and that you publish. Slide. Your new customer. Your new customer was born into the internet industry. They immediately know how to handle an iPhone. They immediately know how to handle a tablet. They don't know what it means to actually walk up uh, to a TV to change a channel or to say, oh, I have to uh, go on AOL and connect first and then get to the internet. Their environment right now is that they open up their device and they're connected to the internet and they can begin to do the searches that they need to do. So you got to think about designing your products and services for this new customer. I hope that uh, you've enjoyed our time today. Um, this, this talk, this presentation, as I said, will be available, as well as uh, the article will be published that I wrote about this topic uh, by uh, DCL uh, on May 1st. 
It's been my pleasure to, uh, to be your host today. And now I will turn it back over to Marianne. Thank you so much, Darrell. That was really, really great. Um, I invite anybody to submit questions they may have. We have a few that I'd like to pose to you. Um, and we can still accept a few more if you'd like to submit anything. But Darrell, can you speak to what, um, I have a question here, what can I do right now to get my digital revenue to increase? I, I think the first thing that I would recommend any, any company to do is to do a reality gap analysis to understand currently where are you from 1 to 10 in, in having a digital revenue strategy. If, 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 you're over, if you have converted your journals but you haven't done your books, so you can say that, okay, for the author's experience, you're 50% of the way there simply because you, your, your, your book's on board and start to think about your business models. For those that have not migrated uh, their journals um, and have not migrated their books, um, I would say the most important thing to do is to, is, to, is to establish an RFP to understand what it will cost you to do this and, and to get started right away. Someone will ask the question, well, what's the business model? Well, the business model, quite simply, is to be in business. If you don't have a mobile strategy or a mobile app right now, you're not a player, a true player in this game, which means that in order for you to give the best experience to your community, your user community, they want to access your information by any means necessary. So think about the highways into your information. If you just simply have the information on your, on your, on your website, um, that, that people go to your search engine, they do it, but you don't have a mobile app, um, you haven't thought about smart TV, you haven't thought about an, an iPad app, you are limiting those, those potential users from having greater benefit of your content. Thanks. Um, can, you, can you go over what in-house skill sets are needed to support a digital workflow? Um, someone asked if knowledge of XML is absolutely necessary? Um, I think you need to have someone, I mean, there, there, there are companies such as uh, DCL and RSI who specialize in this, um, but I would say that you need to have someone in-house who understand, un understood the, the vernacular, the jargon. Uh, they necessarily don't need to be an expert because, um, quite frankly, you want to outsource that to, to, to RSI, DCL, people who this is their specialty. So, but you do want to have a chief information officer type of person who, who can understand um, the, uh, the language and, and, and speak to your needs to your particular vendors. Thanks. Um, what trends do you foresee in publishing over the next few years? Um, I, I think that, um, of course, um, getting, getting all content on, on your site is very, very important. That's first and foremost. Secondly, I think web governance is another factor that folks are not aware about, um, but they will learn a lot about it. Lisa Welchman, a good friend of mine, she has a business called Welchman Pierpoint. Her focus is on web governance, and web governance covers your appearance and how uh, the community uh, can access your information on your site. A lot of times, unfortunately, you'll find that with not because of a lot of effort on, on folks' part, but the website just not is just not intuitive to the user. So they, they have to really find. It's really tough to find information. Sec third is semantic technology. I, I think that semantic technology. Um, we're seeing that it, uh, it's trending up in a lot of ways. We're we're seeing more press releases about more uh, institutions that have uh, hired one of the semantic technology platforms or companies are working with them. Um, I, that's, that's one of the areas of specialty that Country Media Group in, uh, does in semantic technology. Um, we help people get through there. And, and the key thing about semantic technology that a lot of people need to understand is that it's taking search to the next level. Right now we're in a, we're in a vertical search mode where you get pages of results. Well, semantic technology allows you to aggregate 
a large corpus of data and to create a one-page visualization of weighted relevant concepts, which allows the, the researcher to get the total view of the result set. So that's very important. I, I think yeah. that we're, we're going to see the convergence. As I talked about smart TV, um, a lot of folks are not familiar with what's going on with smart TV, but again, it, it, it's another conduit by which information can be shared. So you want to make sure that you utilize an HTML5 that you're able to go across all these different domains, these, these different um, um, devices. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. Is you know we're starting to hear big data that term all over the place, and um, as publishers increase their digital presence and their digital content, the the next important thing is going to be okay. Now, how do I find this? How do my users find that? Right. That's right. Um, can you give some examples of larger companies that are um, seeing their digital revenue surpassing print? Well, I, I think if you look at Elsevier, uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but Elsevier, um, their, their electronic has surpassed their, their print because of, of, of their business model, their business model where folks can uh, move online and drop the print. Um, that has that has flipped the the model for them and has worked out very well. Um, Springer is no different, um, as well as uh, Walters Kluwer and Wiley. So I I, th I think that um, you know there are clear evidence that they started to do this years ago. So it's you might look at okay I I I I got to figure out well what's the business model for this. But as I said in the, in the opening of my presentation. Um, it's not about you know which revenue is bigger. It's just that your users are demanding digital. So you know you, you might be all print today, uh, but your I would say that your business is in harm's way if it, if it's not digital. It's true. Um, can you speak at how existing editorial design production jobs will change with this this to support a shift from print to digital workflow? I think it's going to make it more efficient. Um, uh, when I was at Colexis, we had a product called the uh, Reviewer, Reviewer Finder. And basically, that won a Cody Award for the SIA back in 2010. I think that's what prompted uh, my good friends at Elsevier to acquire Colexis. But this is a tool by which an editor um, can find a peer review group based upon a matching of the concepts of the manuscript versus the research done by a group of researchers. So it allows them to immediately match the, the manuscript to researchers who had similar, uh, reviewers who had similar research, and it allows the editor to find new people to, to conduct peer review. I think that's one clear example. And, and I think that what we're going to find is that it should speed up the peer review process. Um, the peer review process is, is sometimes can move slow for a host of reasons. Sometimes the, the reviewer um, comes back and says, oh, you need to uh, better answer this question about this particular part of the research, or you need to do more research in this area. Okay, so th that is something that the researcher has to do. But when the researcher has tools that allow them to uh, uh, better determine the aims and scopes of which journal they should submit their, their journal to because of a matching of concepts. Um, that will allow the editor to say, oh, wow, this paper is spot on to our aims and scopes, and let me send it to our reviewers. So I, I think you have those opportunities that's going to really help to improve the, the, the process. And uh, the, 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 there's a, a company called eDance out of Japan. They have a, uh, an application that they're going to launch uh, next, next month. Uh, that allows a, a researcher to plug their paper into their engine and determine which journal is the best journal to submit it to. So I think that's going to help move research along at a faster rate, which is good for everyone. Um, and we have one last question here. Are people in the math, chem, physics worlds really wanting to see their complex info, um, including formulae, on mobile devices? I, I, you know what, I, I, you know, as, as we can see, the mobile devices are becoming of many different sizes and shapes. And I think the key thing there is that someone would be able to identify 
uh, with that type of information. And if they need to view it on a larger monitor at a, at a, at a later time, as one of my slides showed the, utilizing the cloud, I think they will want to do that. I, I think it's all about making them aware of what's there and allowing them to bookmark it and then look at it later. Yes, and I do, and I do see speaking from uh, the CMS perspective of we, as we see MathML being integrated in some of these new tools that that issue is sort of taken away. It's not even an issue with some right. of the technologies, the, the tagging technologies and the markup languages and the tools that support them. Well, thank you so much, Darrell. This was really, really a good webinar. Um, I'd like to thank Linda and Vincent from Data Conversion Laboratory. This series, Reality Check, is an ongoing series throughout the year. I welcome people to visit rsicms.com and dclab.com to keep apprised of upcoming webinars in the series. And you, everyone will be receiving an email with a link to this recording and Darrell's uh, published report. Thank you, everyone. And this will conclude today's webinar. Thank Bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.